tonight on Revolutionaries. Very often, technologists who are enamored with the positive aspects of what they have developed or are developing uh, overlook the limitations. Dr. John Holdren is the president's chief science advisor. It's a big job. It covers everything from guarding against nuclear attacks to high-tech brain research. Tonight, Dr. Holdren talks about his wide-ranging portfolio with John Markoff of the New York Times. Major funding for revolutionaries is provided by the Intel Corporation. Do you think of yourself as a Californian? Originally, certainly. Uh, I'm uh, pretty much bi-coastal now, but um, yeah, I was raised in San Mateo. How, how early did you come to Northern California? At the age of four. I was born in Pittsburgh, oh, Pennsylvania. Great. My parents moved to San Mateo when I was four. I grew up in San Mateo, went to public schools in San Mateo, then went east to school to MIT, but I came back to Stanford for my PhD and lived, my wife and I lived in California for 30 years as adults before moving east. I, I read that you're passionate about fishing in the east, and so I thought, well, that's not backpacking in the Sierras. Well, I, I, I was passionate about backpacking in the Sierras for the 30 years that I lived here as an adult, and even when I was a teenager, I backpacked. So it, it, it's the way I wanted to start tonight. Um, I'm t I, too, am passionate about backpacking in the Sierras, and there is actually a glacier in Northern California, not in the Sierras, but in the Trinity Alps. It's literally gone away in the 30 years that I've been hiking there. Um, it's <clears throat> just not there. And um, so I wanted to begin, begin with climate, um, and I wanted to... to actually begin with something that you said to the New York Times in 2007. Um, to quote, you said, I am one of those who believes that any reasonably comprehensive and up-to-date look at the evidence makes clear that civilization has already generated dangerous anthropogenic interference in the climate system. And then you add, uh, what keeps me going is my belief that there is still a chance of avoiding catastrophe. So here we are six years later. How are we doing? Well, first of all, I would reiterate that optimism and say there is still a chance of avoiding catastrophe. We are not doing uh, as much as we should be, uh, not doing as much as we could be, but we, were, we are doing a whole lot more than we were uh, six years ago when I wrote those words. The climate action plan that the president rolled out on June 25th in his speech at Georgetown University uh, has a lot of the elements that we need in uh, a national climate plan and in an international strategy. Uh, we actually, notwithstanding the inability to get a comprehensive uh, climate law passed in the first two years of the first term, uh, did get a lot done that was relevant, including uh, the most forward-leaning fuel economy standards uh, in, the, in the history of the country, some of the most forward-leaning fuel economy standards in the world now being uh, extended to uh, heavy vehicles as well, uh, making a big difference, uh, big boosts in investments in uh, low carbon and no carbon energy technologies, uh, a variety of, of programs and policies uh, that have led actually to a decline in greenhouse gas emissions in the United States. So you think that there's, a, there's, a clear, there's evidence that there is a link, that we've, we've changed these things and you can see it in the... In, in oh, the, oh in abso the in absolutely the you can see it. Um, scientists can see it, but, but uh, everyday folks in their experiences of the world around them and what they see on the television uh, can see that things have changed. And the only question for folks observing that things have changed is whether humans are doing it or whether it's just part of uh, a, a natural cycle of some kind. But the evidence is in fact overwhelming that humans are largely responsible for what we're experiencing. And the evidence is also overwhelming that it's already harmful. You know, in occasion, occasional pieces you see uh, arguments about whether harmful interference in the, in the climate system has already occurred, but in fact we're experiencing uh, increases in heat waves, increases in droughts, in floods, in wildfires, very clearly linked by fingerprints of a variety of kinds to global climate change. Uh, we know, of course, that sea level is inexorably rising, that that is causing increases in coastal property damage, increased damage in storms when storm surge is added onto the increased sea level. Um, and of course, as you note, glaciers are going away over most of the planet. Uh, 
You, I think I saw you quoted as saying that you felt global warming was a poor choice of words in a sense. That, that I, I do think it's a poor choice of words. Global warming implies something, first of all, that's uniform around the globe, that is all about temperature, that is gradual, and that might even be good for you. There's sort of a sense of warming, how could that be all bad? Yeah. Uh, and the fact is, it's highly non-uniform uh, regionally and globally for a whole variety of, of reasons. <clears throat> it's for example, uh, two or three times as fast as the global average at high latitudes. So you're seeing in Alaska and around the high latitudes much faster change, and it's well understood why. Uh, it's not all about temperature. It's about all of the variables and patterns that make up climate. That means hot and cold, wet and dry, uh, windy, stormy, mm -hmm. um, when the snow melts, uh, how fast it runs off. Uh, all, all of that is climate, and in fact, temperature is just a proxy, if you will, for the overall state of the climate system, in much the same way as your body temperature is a proxy for the state of your body system. You know, people say, well, what's a couple degrees centigrade, say 3.6 degrees Fahrenheit among friends? Well, if your body temperature goes up 3.6 degrees Fahrenheit, you know it's telling you something about the state of the system. It's not the temperature per se, it's the indicator that something is badly wrong, and similarly, if the global surface temperature goes up by two degrees Fahrenheit. It's not just the two degrees Fahrenheit on the average that we're experiencing. It's all the changes in circulation patterns and precipitation patterns and storm tracks <clears throat> that go with that, that that should worry us. Was there a recent report that suggested while the rate might be dramatic that there's less concern about really dramatically dis disruptive things? Uh, I don't think there's less concern about dramatically disruptive things. I think there's more. The latest report from the National yeah. Academy of Sciences just out a few weeks ago, uh, to me, is uh, a quite pessimistic report, uh, noting that uh, disruptive climate change, which is the title of their report, uh, disruptive climate change can result not just from very rapid changes in the climate variables themselves, it can result from situations where gradual changes in the climate variables push ecological processes over a threshold. And so That's what I was asking. Yeah. Uh, you, you can have abrupt change resulting even from gradual changes, like changes in sea level, where a gradual change in sea level may lead to, uh, after a relatively short time, saltwater intrusion in uh, freshwater aquifers in coastal regions. Again, it can lead to major increases in storm damage. Uh, you have the situation with the coral reefs, where the coral reefs are the second largest reservoir of biodiversity on the planet after the tropical forests. And the coral reefs now appear quite unlikely to survive a global average surface temperature increase of more than about a degree and a half centigrade. Uh, and Again, it doesn't when matter. We, at current rates, when will we cross that? How, how soon is that? Probably 2035 or 2040. Um, and of course, the coral reefs are subject to multiple stresses. They're experiencing ocean acidification, which is also associated with the buildup of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere, some of which uh, ends up being dissolved in the ocean and producing carbonic acid. They're being subjected to overfishing. They're being subjected to physical damage by cruise cruise ships that anchor uh, and pull out a big chunk of coral reef every time they pull the anchor up. You may not think that's a big problem until you look at the number of cruise ships, ships in the world and how often they anchor on coral reefs. But they're under assault from all of these things. And it appears that just from the standpoint of the combination of acidification and temperature, that the coral reefs will probably be close to finished uh, by halfway through this century. Uh, that's very gloomy news indeed, uh, not just because they're the source of a large part of the biodiversity on the planet, but because the other major source, the tropical forests, are also differentially vulnerable to climate change. We're in danger of drying out the Amazon. Uh, so the most recent Mauna Loa number that I could find is 39366, and I was wondering if you could explain that. It, I mean, is it, could you put a context around that, that number? Well, the, the, the pre-industrial concentration of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere was around 280 parts per million, and now we're nearly at 400 parts per million. So in round numbers, we've gone up by uh, some 40% in the concentration of CO2 in the atmosphere. But in addition, 
we've added more methane, chlorofluorocarbons, uh, black carbon particulates that tend to warm the planet. We've masked part of it because we've also added reflecting particulates to the atmosphere. Mm -hmm. But is there, I mean, in looking at that number, that single number, can you see a, a, a particular number that's a point of no return? No, there is no red line that's a point of no return. You know, people have said, and in fact the G20 have agreed that we should try to avoid exceeding a global average surface temperature of two degrees Celsius above pre-industrial, and that is associated with an atmospheric concentration around 450 parts per million of carbon dioxide equivalent. That is counting not just the CO2, but the net effects of other warming and cooling things we add to the atmosphere. If it all adds up to 450 parts per million, you have about a 50% chance of staying below two degrees C above the pre-industrial level. And some people have concluded that because the G20 agreed on that as a target, that that must be the red line, yeah. and below that is safe, and above that is dangerous. And that's nonsense, because we already are experiencing, as I've already argued, dangerous climatic effects at a CO2 concentration of under 400 parts per million, and a CO2 equivalent concentration that's not much different, because very roughly speaking, the reflective particles are currently canceling out the effects of most of the non-CO2 warming factors. And so the actual CO2 concentration, which is approaching 400 parts per million, is very close to the CO2 equivalent number. And again, with that number around 400, we're already hurting. Yeah. In addition, and this is something that relatively few people outside the climate science community understand, because of lags in the Earth's climate system, we are not yet experiencing the full climate consequences of the greenhouse gases that are already in the atmosphere. In other words, if we could stop instantaneously mm -hmm. and hold the atmospheric concentrations where they are right now at, say, 400 parts per million CO2 equivalent, the temperature would continue to coast up from the current roughly 0.9 degrees C above pre-industrial to something like 1.5 mm -hmm. degrees C above pre-industrial. So it may not be possible now to stop in time to save the coral reefs. But it is certainly possible to stop in time to avoid a lot of other consequences that we would uh, be very unhappy about. And so I wanted to ask you about strategies that we might pursue to make big changes here in the United States. Um, natural gas, there's been this dramatic change over a relatively short period of time. Is it right to think of natural gas as a bridge fuel? It is right to think of it as a bridge fuel. It's not a long-term solution, because over the very long run, even natural gas causes too much uh, CO2 to be added to the atmosphere. But uh, in round numbers, uh, natural gas emits about half as much carbon dioxide to the atmosphere as coal burning does per kilowatt hour of electricity generated by those two sources. And so substituting out coal with natural gas yes brings you a big benefit. It's just not big enough for where we need to go. You know, the president announced a goal of 17% below 2005 emissions for this country by 2020. Natural gas can help a lot getting to that goal. But the next goal that the president, I think, correctly announced was to get more than 80% below 2005 emissions by 2050. And you can't do that with natural gas. Yes. Natural gas emits too much CO2. Even given the tremendous controversy about solar, um, the price has been falling dramatically, hasn't it? And it, can, it, can it step in and do something in a major way? It has. The, uh, the, not only has the price of solar energy uh, continued to fall, but we have actually quintupled the amount of solar electricity generation in this country since 2008. Uh, we have more than doubled the amount of wind energy, uh, wind electricity generation in this country since 2008, and wind is actually much bigger than solar at this point. Solar started from a smaller base, and so even though it quintupled, it's still not nearly as big as wind, which has doubled and some uh, over this period. They're both getting less expensive. Our aim in the sunshot global challenge is to make solar energy, solar electricity, cheaper than coal. And uh, I think that's entirely plausible uh, by 2020. 
<laughs> so uh, let me ask a hypothetical question. If you were a scientific advisor to a billion dollar venture capital fund instead of your current role as the president's <laughs> scientific advisor, with a 100 year time horizon and a goal of averting a dangerous level of global warming, and you had to pick one of the following as your top priority. Uh, let me give you a list, and uh, I mean, you're welcome to reject the idea, but um, would you uh, invest in carbon capture, energy efficiency, including smart grids, nanotechnology, natural gas, next generation nuclear, centralized renewables, distributed renewables, or solar radiation management? Could you, could you pick one? Uh, no, I couldn't pick one. I would do all, all but the last. Okay. <laughs> uh, and, and solar radiation management, which is uh, another term for geoengineering, okay. is again something on which uh, I would recommend doing studies to understand uh, what we'd be getting into if we tried it. Uh, again, one of the dangers there is grasping in desperation at solutions that are not solutions. Uh, if there are solutions there, we need to find them. And if there are only non-solutions there, we need to know it. Um, what was your personal route into climate issues? I became interested very early on in my career as a technologist in the proposition that uh, technological silver bullets, technological panaceas, were being oversold. Uh, I was struck by a saying of one of the great physicists of the 20th century, Arnold Sommerfeld, who in 1946 said, by 1960, nuclear energy will have abolished poverty from the face of the earth. <laughs> That's an exact quote. Uh, and, and, and of course, uh, the fact that that couldn't possibly come true says as much about poverty as it does about nuclear energy. The notion is that very often technologists who are enamored with the positive aspects of what they have developed or are developing uh, overlook the limitations. And so as a technologist myself, I thought it was my responsibility to try to understand not just what the opportunities and possibilities and potentials were, but what the limits might be. And uh, er early on in pursuing that idea, it became uh, apparent that environmental limitations were among the most serious ones in the energy space. Uh, my own uh, work when I was working on my PhD was on theoretical plasma physics, and the application that I was most interested in was fusion energy. Uh, and the story about fusion energy was that it will be infinitely abundant, dirt cheap, completely safe, uh, no proliferation hazards whatsoever, and it will be the holy grail. And while I thought and still think fusion energy would be very much worth having, it turns out that it too has liabilities, constraints, and limitations. And my thought was if we understand clearly what those are, we can work to minimize them during the design process rather than look for patchwork solutions afterwards. And about the time I was thinking these thoughts, a number of other uh, much more senior and experienced people were coming up with studies uh, which were reinforcing those views. For example, in 1970, there was a summer study done at MIT with researchers from all over the world called the Study of Critical Environmental Problems, asking are there environmental problems that are serious enough to be considered really critical in terms of their impacts on human well-being? And they came up with a list of about 22, of which 15 were associated with energy supply. And it was already apparent at that time that climate change was likely to be the most problematic of all of the environmental impacts of energy, not least because carbon dioxide is not just a sort of a side effect, it's the, one of the principal combustion products of burning fossil fuels. I was wondering about uh, what kind of influence Sputnik might have had on you. You were 13, I think, when Sputnik was... A, a, a big one, yeah. I was, I was just going into high school, my freshman year in high school. And uh, like everybody else, I could see this little glimmer, this little dot moving across the sky and understood what it was. Uh, and uh, certainly it had a big impact. I mean, I had been reading about space and rocketry and so on for, for years at that point, and I had been making uh, solid fuel rockets out of my mother's used lipstick tubes in the, <laughs> in, in the backyard with, with chemistry set ingredients. Oh, the, 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 uh, but, 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 but the actual experience of seeing Sputnik up there was very dramatic. So your own career as an amateur rocketeer, how high did you 
how successful were you with your mom's um, lipstick tubes? A couple hundred feet. That's not bad. <laughs> and so then, how did you, your first job was at Lockheed after, after high school? What, what led yeah, you I, to? I had a, a Lockheed scholarship to MIT, and to my delight, the Lockheed scholarship included summer jobs at Lockheed. Oh, okay. and, and the first one was right after my senior year in high school, even before I'd started at MIT. I had a job at Lockheed in, in uh, Palo Alto. And then in subsequent summers, uh, I worked at Lockheed in Sunnyvale and got very wide experience of the, uh, of the aerospace industry yeah. in these various summer jobs. In did, fact, did you have to have a clearance then, even in? Well, it, it, in fact, the first summer, right after my senior year in high school, the, the clearance I had was a company confidential. Uh, and I was, I was working on putting parts together for the orbital programmer of the Midas spy satellite. The second summer, I was given uh, a job. I now had a whole uh, year of MIT Aero and Astro under my belt, and I was given a job in a, a group called Reentry Aerodynamics. And I didn't have a clearance at the beginning of the summer, but the first report I wrote, they classified secret, and they took all my notes away as well as the report. <laughs> and the third time that happened, they gave up and went through the rigmarole of getting me a clearance. So I had my first secret clearance at, uh, at uh, 19. You know, we could talk for the entire hour about climate, but I wanted to ask you if you could point to some of the other important initiatives in, in OSTP now. I mean, if you had to sort of yeah. point to other high points. Yeah, and I, I would name a, a, a number of them. And, and when you say initiatives in OSTP, I mean, these are really initiatives of the administration, initiatives of the yeah. president in which OSTP has played a role. But uh, a very big set of initiatives has been around the role of science, technology, and innovation in driving economic growth, in creating new businesses, new industries, new jobs, uh, high quality jobs uh, particularly. And uh, the president announced already in September 2009 um, a, a major uh, initiative in innovation in which <clears throat> we basically asked, what are the underpinnings of an innovative economy? And we concluded, and the president rolled this out in, in September of, of 2009, there are a whole set of foundational elements that we need to invest in. One is basic research and the institutions that do basic research. One is science, technology, engineering, and math education, STEM education, where we concluded we have to lift the country's game in STEM education, both to get the high-tech entrepreneurs and the inventors and the discoverers uh, of the future, but also to get the tech-savvy workforce uh, that the 21st century economy requires. Uh, another one of the foundations is the, the forms of infrastructure that are relevant to innovation. And that includes, of course, information technology, computing, uh, monitoring, uh, space technology, uh, a whole set of infrastructural uh, elements, broadband, wireless, uh, and so on. And the, the fourth foundational element is the political and economic environment that is not only receptive to, but nurturing of entrepreneurship and innovation. And the administration proceeded then to construct specific initiatives focused on these various foundational elements, a whole set of initiatives in STEM education, a set of initiatives in information technology, in making uh, high-speed broadband more widely available, a whole set of initiatives in around uh, making government data um, more accessible, more open, uh, and in usable form so entrepreneurs could build businesses and develop new services uh, based on the availability of these enormous uh, data sets that the taxpayers had paid uh, to uh, create. Um, we've had major initiatives in health information technology, figuring out how to use IT to get better outcomes for more people at lower costs. Uh, we've had, um, of course, major initiatives uh, in the energy space. We've had uh, an advanced manufacturing partnership, which is looking to the private sector, the academic sector, and the government to work together 
to figure out how to bring back manufacturing in the United States using advanced technologies, IT, robotics, nanotechnology, uh, other dimensions of material science, synthetic biology, uh, the so-called bioeconomy. Do, th do you think, you know, beginning in the late 1980s, um, in industrial policy be became a, a real political struggle on, on Capitol Hill. And we don't call it that anymore. I know. And the term went away. But, and, you know, we still fight over choosing winners and losers. Um, uh, there are lots of fights, but do you think that, I mean, if you look at it from Silicon Valley rather than from Washington, it's clear the government played a role, but often the role feels very serendipitous. It doesn't feel like innovation can be planned uh, frequently, although it clearly has had a role. Well, it, 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 it can't be planned uh, and, and shouldn't be, but what we understand very clearly now is that a fundamental role of government is to support basic research, which is research at a stage before you can determine what the outcome is likely to be, what the implications are likely to be, right. what products are likely to emerge from it. It's very well understood by economists why the private sector will never invest in basic research to the level that society's interests require. Yeah. The risks are too high, the outcome's too uncertain, the potential research returns too distant, the findings not always appropriable. Uh, and so we know that government investments in basic research have been enormously important over the years. You know, it was uh, NSF grants to a couple of Stanford graduate students named Larry Page and Sergey Brin, which ultimately led to the company we all know uh, very close by. Yeah. With last I looked, $270 billion in market capitalization, tens of thousands of employees. Classic serendipitous uh, investment. And, and, and so on. If you were to ask Charles Towns, as he was sitting on a park bench in Lafayette Square in Washington, D.C., thinking about the Maser, which was the predecessor of the laser, Charlie Towns had absolutely no idea that the technologies that grew from this area of basic research would be how we cut metal, how we copy, how we determine distances, how we listen to music and watch movies. I mean, it would be insanity yeah. uh, for, so, for Charlie Towns to have envisioned that. Uh, the, but it was government investments in that kind of research. But, uh, look at the genomics revolution, government investments. Look at, you talked about natural gas and fracking. Look at seismic exploration, horizontal drilling. Uh, it was government investments, even in that area of practical application, right. that then led to oil company investments, that then led to the development of technologies that actually worked. Do you worry that the DARPA of today, for example, that funds many of those, has funded many of those crucial uh, innovations, is a very different beast than the DARPA of the 1960s, which was committed to? to just very blue sky things without a lot of restrictions on the research. Now, there are, there are milestones and benchmarks, and I know that people... Well, this is partly you know, a reaction to the, to the dilemmas of funding. That is, uh, when money is tight, everybody wants accountability. And doing high risk, high return research in that environment becomes more difficult. But this administration is committed to doing high-risk, high-return research, having the government fund it. And while there was a period in which uh, DARPA uh, had shorter-term focuses and less out-of-the-box thinking, uh, they've really moved back into the outside-the-box thinking, into the high-risk, high-return stuff uh, at the instruction of the administration. I mean, President Obama is remarkably sophisticated about these matters. He understands the importance of basic research. He understands the importance of, of being willing to try hard things and sometimes fail. Uh, and he's willing to continue to back it. And he has backed it in the budgets that he has produced. So out of this budgetary process, how, how much at risk is basic research funding uh, in these budgets? What, well, what know, does it mean? I, I regard that situation as a glass that is both half empty and half full. Uh, basic research budgets are not as big as I think, or as the president thinks, uh, would benefit the country. At the same time, we have done better at protecting basic research in a difficult environment 
than might have been expected. Indeed, research as a whole and basic research have done better under these uh, really very difficult funding constraints than virtually any other sector you can look at. And it's again because the president understands it. When the president went to the National Academy of Sciences just a few months after being inaugurated the first time and spoke at the annual meeting of the National Academy, he was the first president since JFK to do that. And he devoted about two thirds of the speech to the importance of government investments in basic research. You know, I think most people expect that the president's gonna come, he's gonna talk about science and technology in the economy, science and technology in energy, science and technology in health. He spent two thirds of the time talking about the importance of basic research to all of these domains. Basic research as the generator of the insights on which all applied technology and development in the future would draw. And, and he's been true to that in the budgets he's put forward. We haven't always gotten it all through the Congress. You know, one of the things that's quite striking, the Department of Defense, which is about as applied an agency as you can find, has been spending in this administration over $2 billion a year on basic research. I wanted to ask you about space, space exploration. One uh, very pragmatic question and one more philosophical. Um, mining for asteroids, is it worth it as a goal from an economic point of view? Far from clear. It is interesting that there are some private operators who are interested in that possibility. Uh, there are, however, uh, obviously a number of reasons for uh, being interested in technology relating to be able to not only identify uh, asteroids on a collision course with the Earth, but be able to manipulate their trajectories. Uh, because as we were reminded uh, not so long ago uh, with an impact uh, in, in the range of 500 kilotons uh, over Siberia. Uh, asteroids do from time to time strike the Earth. Some of them are big enough to do damage on the surface, and some of them, like the one that hit 65 million years ago, are big enough uh, to exterminate most life on Earth. And um, in order to prove that we are more intelligent than the dinosaurs, it would be prudent for us to figure out uh, how to avoid <laughs> such an outcome should a large asteroid on a collision course occur uh, yeah. in our lifetimes. So we're still uh, pursuing the notion of sending uh, a, a man and, and or women uh, to, to Mars. Wouldn't it make more sense um, to invest in the kind of artificial intelligence technologies that could do that mission without humans? Because not only would we get there, uh, and do the mission, but we would probably get spin-offs that would be dramatically valuable on Earth. Um, it, well, we get spin-offs uh, out of virtually everything we do in space, including uh, there have been many spin-offs uh, from the uh, human space exploration program we've had. Uh, it is an interesting controversy about robotic uh, versus human exploration. As in some other areas we've talked about tonight, I myself am in favor of a portfolio. Uh, I think the robotic missions are enormously important. They're uh, effective. The Curiosity uh, Mars Science Lab, the rover that has been crawling around the surface of Mars uh, making extraordinary discoveries is a great example of the potential of robotic missions. Yeah. I had the pleasure of being in the control room when uh, Curiosity landed. It was a gut-wrenching experience. Yeah, the, it was. <laughs> uh, dur during the period when we knew because of the time lag and the signals getting here, it had already either successfully landed or crashed and burned, <laughs> and we didn't know which. Uh, and uh, I mean, that's, that's fun. it's fabulous stuff, yeah. these robotic missions. Yeah. But there are also things that humans can do and ways in which the human exploration of the solar system fulfills a fundamental desire in the human race to explore uh, that make it worth doing. And so, again, my answer is all of the above. I wouldn't have brought this up, but your staff did. Apparently, there's new information about Area 51. And uh, <laughs> I was wondering if you could tell me what it, we know now about Area 51 <laughs> that we didn't know before. The, uh, <laughs> what, a, what a question. Uh, <laughs> you know, it, it, I, I, was, I was mentioning backstage that I've, I've had the good fortune to know personally every science advisor to a president of the United States since George Kistiakowski, who was 
Eisenhower's second science advisor. And every one of these folks, were they all still alive, would tell you that as soon as they get into office, they receive a spate of letters, <laughs> more recently a spate of emails, demanding the truth about yes. Area 51. Yeah. Uh, admit that there are alien bodies buried there. Uh, there are no alien bodies buried <laughs> in Area 51. It's really um, disappointing to learn that. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm so sorry. <laughs> but uh, Well, uh, to pursue the, al the alien theme, um, you know, every time we turn around, there are more Goldilocks planets discovered. I mean, it's just extraordinary. It is extraordinary. And, and um, you're probably familiar with the Drake equation. I am. And um, are you puzzled? And we're, we're, we're two miles, maybe a mile and a half from SETI's headquarters here. Uh, are you puzzled why we haven't had a, you know, why if there's so many hospitable planets in the universe? Where, haven't, haven't we heard from them? Yeah, anybody? why haven't we heard from them? Well, you know, there, there was actually a very interesting paper written some decades ago now on just this question. The title of the paper was, Where is Everybody? <laughs> and, and a number of hypotheses were put forward for why, given the odds that intelligent life must have developed in a number of different places in the universe, just as a probabilistic matter, uh, why haven't we heard from anybody? And one of the hypotheses was that although intelligent civilizations do develop elsewhere from time to time, they have a very short half-life after they develop nuclear weapons, <laughs> that a large fraction of the, uh, of the civilizations that develop exterminate themselves in fairly short order. Another hypothesis is they quickly learn that it's a bad idea to advertise their presence. <laughs> and so uh, they do all their communication with fiber optic cables rather than sending radio yes, signals please. around that could propagate and lead to a predatory civilization yeah. uh, finding them and devouring them. Yeah. So, uh, I mean, obviously nobody knows the answer to this question and nobody knows whether the probabilistic equation is really right because we don't really understand enough about exactly how life began to be confident that uh, it, it, it has arisen uh, a huge number of times elsewhere in the universe. But again, based on what we do know, it does seem awfully likely that there is life elsewhere in the universe. And if there's life, there must, in some circumstances, be intelligent life. Yeah. I wanted to ask you more about robotics. One of your initiatives was on collaborative robotics, building machines that could work effectively with humans. Last year, when I was reporting about uh, the, the growth of manufacturing robotics, I, I took a very interesting tour at a Flextronics, Flextronic plant that makes solar panels in Fremont. And they had a big sign on the wall that said, um, bringing, because Governor Brown was about to visit, bringing jobs and manufacturing back to California. And I did a careful count of the number of people who were on this very automated line. And, and there were nine people. I think I read your, <laughs> your article or your blog yeah, about this. And, and so it's a difficult, I mean, it's a good news, bad news potential situation. I would, certainly would not criticize your, um, your initiative. Um, but you know, we may end up with an economy that actually doesn't have more jobs, even though it's more productive and, and more competitive internationally. And I wonder if you've, 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 you've looked at that challenge. Well, well, first of all, this is certainly outside my domain of expertise. I'm very familiar with the challenge and uh, certainly aware that the composition of employment is constantly changing. That is, we have far fewer jobs in agriculture now than we did 100 years ago in this country. And that's partly due to mechanization obviously, and other ways in which productivity in agriculture has increased. But the uh, unemployment rate on the average is not much different than it was uh, a long time ago because many other kinds of jobs have materialized and the people who once were doing agriculture are now doing uh, other productive things. And I think the same thing uh, is true uh, in uh, many of the manufacturing fields, is there will be certainly jobs for people who can work with the high technology processes that are involved in modern manufacturing, but there won't be as many of them as used to exist uh, on assembly lines that were mainly populated by people. And there will be, at the same time, jobs in other industries. I mean, look at information technology. Where was information technology 30 years ago? Yeah. And where is it now in terms of the number of jobs? 
No, to your, to your Google point, I mean, who would have thought that there would be this job category called search engine optimization, <laughs> yeah, which right. employs hundreds of thousands exactly. of people? Uh, yeah. You know, most people, uh, the, the name John Poindexter hasn't come up much in this current round of, of, of negotiations, which kind of surprises me because Poindexter, for all he was vilified for in originally developing the Total Information Awareness Program, had this notion that some way, somehow you could square the circle between big data and individual privacy. And he actually brought a large number of computer scientists together in an effort to see if there was a way to do that. Nothing came of it, but it seems to be a, a, a pressing uh, challenge for the technologists. It is. Uh, there's an enormous challenge there. And, it, and it's one that we have looked at in, in many of its different dimensions. For example, uh, relatively early in this administration, the President's Council of Advisors on Science and Technology, PCAST, uh, did a major report about health IT. I mentioned in my quick catalog of some of the things that the administration has done uh, in initiatives uh, in science and technology is in the health information technology domain. And uh, a very distinguished group, uh, not just members of PCAST, but a larger working group that they assembled grappled with this question of just in the health domain of how do you get the benefits of uh, more uh, rapid and complete sharing of patient medical records between patients and physicians and between different physicians who are treating the same patient? And how do you get the benefit of knowing what has worked and what has not worked in trying uh, to address maladies that are uh, afflicting millions of people? Mm -hmm. How do you do all that while protecting privacy? That's already a big challenge. I mean, leaving aside the national security and anti-terrorism and the national intelligence space, just in the health IT domain, it's a huge challenge. A lot of effort has gone into figuring out how to do that. And there will need to be more effort still uh, in this whole big data domain uh, across all of its applications if, if we're to successfully get it right. I want to turn to these, but before I do, I, I just have to ask you about my favorite PCAST report, um, which was done last year, and it was on the issue of spectrum and using spectrum uh, in a modern way with computation. Uh, and uh, what struck me about reading the report at the time, I can't remember the specific numbers, but the notion is you could so much more efficiently use spectrum that it would basically have one of these indirect serendipitous effects and perhaps recreate in the mobile wireless world, the kind of uh, uh, economic boom that we had with the internet. Do, do, you, do you remember that report? Oh, absolutely. Have you made any, have you absolutely, made any? I remember the report. There's been a huge amount of follow-up to that report, a huge amount of interest in it in, the, in industry and in government. Uh, the, uh, the new FCC chairman, Tom Wheeler, is, uh, is very interested in moving forward with this. There's been a lot of uh, action since the time of the report. I think we could find a thousand megahertz free uh, somewhere sure. to, to, well, you know, to run the again, experiment. You know, the, 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 the most fundamental proposition is, is not just that spectrum today, while it uh, seems to be running out, uh, there's only a finite amount of it, and there seem to be exponentially increasing demands for it, right. uh, particularly because of the enormous success of broadband uh, wireless. So the sort of the initial position is, well, we look around and we see what parts of it really aren't being all that intensively used so that we can uh, reallocate it more efficiently. But there's a much more scientifically interesting and more fundamental idea uh, in spectrum sharing in that the kinds of technologies we know how to build today can basically allow multiple users to use the same spectrum without interfering with each other. And that is the, the proposition that underlies the most forward-leaning recommendations in that report and the ones that we're most interested in seeing implemented uh, in, in the decade ahead. That is the, is the insight that will turn a situation of scarcity in spectrum into a situation of abundance. Is the White House looking into any long-range programs like the National Highway Program or the Apollo Program? Uh, well, that sort of brings up the, the question of grand challenges. Uh, I mean, the Apollo program was a great example of a grand challenge. President Kennedy says we're going to go to the moon, put, put humans on the moon by the end of the decade. 
uh, we have a number of grand challenges uh, underway now. One is the sunshot, let's make solar energy uh, as cheap as coal. Another is EV everywhere, let's make it uh, attractive and technologically and economically uh, practical to have electric cars uh, everywhere that provide the same performance and convenience of transportation that gasoline fuel cars do today. Uh, uh, another uh, grand challenge is the BRAIN initiative, uh, which the president uh, announced last year, in which uh, for a multitude of purposes, we're bringing together uh, multidisciplinary teams and, and a diversity of approaches to better understand how the brain works, to better map the brain, to understand the functioning of large groups of neurons acting together rather than simply looking at neurons one at a time. We'll never understand uh, what the brain does until we can do that. Uh, this is an enormous challenge. You know, the Human uh, Genome Project was a grand challenge, uh, which, by the way, it's been estimated has returned $140 in economic activity okay. for every dollar the government yeah. uh, invested. Sort of getting back to this question of the relation between basic science and ultimate uh, outcomes for the society. So we are actually very enamored in this administration of the power of grand challenges to inspire, to energize, to get people uh, working together in pursuit of a big inspirational common goal. Uh, how do we value STEM education? How does it correlate to, co to compensation for teachers and educators? That's actually a great question. And the, the answer, first of all, is we don't value it nearly highly enough. Uh, we don't value education in general highly enough, particularly at the K through 12 level. There was just another uh, report that came out in the last week or so uh, trying to look at detail, in detail at why countries that do better than the United States, Singapore, Finland, South Korea, what are they doing differently to get such uh, superior outcomes in standardized tests in science and math? And one of the answers that emerged from this comparative study is that virtually all of the countries that do better than we pay teachers much better than we oh, do. No shock. They make... Uh, <laughs> T teaching is a very high prestige position, and it's suitably compensated in terms of the, of, the, of the salaries of teachers and principals. I mean, this is a, a, a very fundamental uh, insight. And, of course, there is a challenge associated with this, that in most of these countries that have done this, uh, education is uh, controlled by the national government. So they can make a decision as a country as to how they're going to do this. In the United States, of course, uh, education, K through 12 education, is largely in the province of the states and communities. And, and so it's a harder thing to wave a wand and say uh, everybody is going to pay teachers better. Put the National Science Foundation budget into perspective relative to other nationally funded programs, then rationalize it. It's tiny. <laughs> <laughs> well, let, let me say a couple of things about that. Uh, the National Science Foundation budget is about $7.5 billion a year. Uh, the NIH budget is about $30 billion a year. Um, and the uh, DOE Office of Science is about $5 billion a year. Uh, science at NASA is about $9.5 billion a year. Uh, if you look at the whole uh, federal science budget, applied uh, and basic research, but not development, it's about $64 billion a year. Now, is that enough when the military budget is, in round numbers, five or $600 billion a year? Uh, should we be spending more on science? Uh, a lot of us think so. Uh, but anybody who reads the newspaper or watches the television knows that we have uh, a very challenging uh, budget situation in the government, uh, reaching agreement between the parties on what the budget should be and what the priorities within it should be has been an enormous challenge. When I looked at um, international research and development, spending comparatively 
Um, we spend far more than any other country. We are by far really, the biggest. I was actually yeah. kind of struck. But and then well, you public and yeah, public and private, we spend over four hundred billion a yeah. year on R and D. Yeah. And one of the things that most people don't recognize, unless they're uh, geeks who study these statistics, is that industry uh, funds about two thirds. Uh, of all the research and development done in this country. Of course, they are heavier on development and the government is heavier uh, on the basic uh, research and applied is more evenly split. But, um, but we do spend more than any other country. China is catching up. And number two. China is study. number two. Yeah. And China has been increasing its R&D expenditures by something like 20% per year. Uh, which a little arithmetic reveals will lead to them catching up and surpassing us uh, unless the pattern changes uh, in not very long. Should we worry about something like the fact that they have the world's fastest supercomputer now? Is that a, 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 a fact of national concern? Well, I, I would say a couple of things about that. Um, uh, certainly, the Chinese are going to be increasingly formidable competitors in the IT space. Uh, but people who think about supercomputers know that the particular metric on which China currently holds the record is not a particularly informative metric about the real capacity of high-performance computers. Yeah. Uh, and the capacity to handle big data is, in fact, probably more important today than pure floating-point operations yeah. per second. I know a group of people who are trying to find a way to run that benchmark on a cluster of iPhones. Uh, and so maybe we can, if you get enough iPhones, maybe we can reclaim the... the well, you know, it was mentioned then in that little film at the beginning, uh, interestingly enough, about how your, how your phone is a thousand times more powerful than an IBM 7094. Uh, <laughs> I, I, I was the uh, operator of an IBM 7094 <laughs> at Lockheed in the early 1960s. That was my summer job for one summer. And I've kept track ever since of the power of the computers I was using compared to that 7094. And the, the last I looked, my laptop was equal to 5,000 oh, yeah. of them. Oh, yeah. I mean, it would take an, yeah. I, it, it's interesting because the IBM 7094 was a big enough computer to handle our thermonuclear weapon design challenges at the time, a big enough computer to do the orbital mechanics for the moon mission. Uh, and so on, and it would probably take six months to boot Windows 8. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> well, th this has substantially more power than the Cray 2 I visited at Livermore. Yeah. And it's substantially more it, power. It, it is stunning. In 18, 1986, the, 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 I think it was. The difference yeah. is really stunning. Yeah. Okay. In fact, we've all got supercomputers in, in our, our pockets. pockets. Yeah. yeah. Let me make this the final question. It's quirky. I'm not quite sure how to interpret it, but... If we switched from income tax to a carbon tax, the whole country would be motivated to fix the issue. Comments. <laughs> <laughs> you know, in, in, in Washington, the T word is anathema. Um, of any kind. And uh, I, mean, I, I, will, I will only point out, therefore, that every economist who has studied the issue concludes that it is more efficient to tax bads than to tax goods. And if you believe that income and capital gains are good and carbon emissions are bad, and if you believe the result that every economist reaches, then we would be better off as a society if we taxed income and capital gains less and taxed carbon more. But that is not to comment on the political feasibility of doing that anytime <laughs> soon. <laughs> well, thank you for coming this evening. I really appreciate it. The Office of Chief Science Advisor to the President was created by Franklin Roosevelt. The first advisor was computer pioneer Van Ever Bush. There are hundreds of stories like this at the Computer History Museum. Join us next time for the Computer History Museum presents Revolutionaries.